Okay, I'm going to go live. Good. So, hi everyone. Um, I see that we do have people joining into the room. So if it's okay with everyone, we're just going to give everyone a few minutes. Um, we'll give them exactly two or so minutes just to be able to join and um, obviously just get into the webinar. I know that today we've had uh, we've had about 150 people saying that they're going to be joining us on this webinar. So I'm really looking forward to some fantastic engagement. So if that's okay with everyone, we'll just give everyone a minute or two to join. Uh, so just to say that we're just giving everyone a minute or two to join. Um, we are expecting quite a few people to join us. So I'm just wanting to give everybody an opportunity to come in. I know that we're all doing a lot of Zoom calls, etc. at the moment. So um, very often you're stuck in one and needing to move over to the next pretty quickly. And there's a bit of a delay in getting across. So we're just going to give everyone one more minute and then we will start. Okay, so um, very, very excited to um, have you all joining us today. We are going to be having a very, very interesting discussion um, with um, Dr. Shamni Mandbad, who is from uh, SAPRA and who heads up the Section 21 division. I'm sure that you will all know um, that sometimes Section 21, uh, the process is a little bit um, uncommon um, and a little bit unfamiliar, particularly with many of our um, rare disease patients, but also just patients with chronic illness who are needing to access uh, treatments that are either um, new or not so commonly used. And um, it can be quite an overwhelming process. So uh, we felt it was necessary in, um, you know, in our efforts to, to educate the public and help healthcare users better understand the systems and the processes, that it would be nice for us to have a, a nice open fluid conversation. And um, I just wanna highlight that we really want to engage. Um, it's not about a one-way discussion. We don't want to overwhelm you with information, but more just to say that we're really, really hoping that everybody can use this opportunity today to, to just A, learn a little bit, but also just ask questions. And I think it goes both ways. We all learn, um, even from our side of the table, in hearing the experience on the ground and what the challenges are, and, and we pick up on what areas need to be improved. So um, we're really, really looking forward to it. I just want to say a big thanks to all of our partners, um, uh, PATH as well as SATAC, and, um, and also to SAPRA for um, being with us today and actually participating in this conversation. Before I hand over to Dr. Manbod, who will be giving her presentation, I thought that it would be um, quite important to just share some of the results of the survey that we sent out earlier today, um, just ahead of this um, obviously webinar and for us it was merely understanding exactly what the um, understanding of section 21 is in the public domain so I'm just going to share a little bit 
um, of what the responses were to that question. So the first was, do you know what a section product 20, uh, a section 21 product is? And there were three options. It was either yes, absolutely, or kind of, or no, not at all. And um, quite surprisingly, only 28% of the respondents are, were actually adamant that they knew uh, what a product, what a section 21 product was. And the, ra the rest of them, um, 41% said kind of, and 31% not at all. Um, then the other question was, have you ever used a Section 21 product? And only 23% of respondents said that they had, which I think is really an indication of just um, how low the understanding is with regards to, with regards to Section 21 and how the, um, how few users there might be. So this is not a common, this is not a common um, practice, although it is quite popular in the Red Sea space because of the entities that we work with. Um, and then the question that I asked next was identify your understanding on the methods of evaluation involved in Section 21 applications, um, because I know that I had misperceptions around this and it took um, a couple of engagements with SAPA for me to clear it up. And interestingly, um, most people knew that safety of the product was one of the things we evaluated, uh, followed by registration status in other countries. So if the product was available in the, uh, you know, it had been approved at the FDA or the EMEA, um, followed by efficacy of the product. But then pricing um, was still deemed to be a, um, a consideration factor. And um, I know that Dr. Manbot will address that today. And then um, we asked, do you know the process to apply for Section 21 products? And 70% of the respondents have said no. And we also asked the question, do you know what the ongoing responsibilities are of using a Section 21 product? And 70%, 77% um, of the uh, respondents said no. So I think it gives us a very, very good indication that there is um, a lot of um, things to be learned today and I'm really really excited to be able to help everybody get a better understanding. Um, just in terms of some housekeeping rules, obviously you all know that um, uh, this is set up as a webinar so you won't be able to necessarily uh, speak or ask questions verbally but you do have the opportunity to use the Q&A functionality. Um, at the bottom of your screens you should all be able to see Q&A and that is an opportunity for you to ask any questions which we can address in the Q&A section and then followed by that there's also the chat functionality but that is more for comments um, and if necessary uh, if you want to put stuff in there I will be obviously keeping track but it is much easier if you have a formalized question that you'd really like answered to use the Q&A uh, session because that um, comes about a little bit more clearer from our perspective as um, admin or hosts. So with that, uh, Dr. Manbod, um, over to you. Hi, Kelly. Um, so um, I'd like to start off by saying uh, a big thank you to you and um, you know we've engaged many times on the issue of rare diseases and unregistered medicines to actually address to manage those diseases and um, I think you know uh, Safra just wants to send a message that we are willing to, we are definitely, we will welcome any opportunity to uh, discuss, you know, our regulatory pathways, our processes, and engage, especially with the end user out there who is the patient. Um, so having said that, I'm just going to uh, share my screen and start my presentation. Um, Okay, so I'm going to uh, just, um, I'm going to actually uh, switch off my video for a while whilst I do this uh, presentation. So um, we, we actually, uh, you know, uh, we're discussing uh, the uh, issue of my presentation here. And I think uh, there was also some kind of, uh, uh, well, there was a, a a request that we also speak on off-label use as well. And um, that was supposed to have been discussed by my senior manager. Now, currently we are very busy at SAPRA with um, a quarterly reporting and other obligations. So he wasn't able to attend. Um, I will be able to say just a few lines on off-label use, but it, it won't be, uh, you know, as, as 
detailed as um, uh, perhaps you would have liked us to speak on. That's purely because it isn't in the mandate of SAPRA to actually oversee off-label use. Um, so if I may just go to the background of how SAPRA has come about. So SAPRA is established in terms of the Medicines and Related Substance, uh, Substances Act as amended. And um, this allowed for SAPRA to uh, you know, uh, establish itself as a Schedule 3A public entity. Um, the Minister of Health then appointed a board and on the 2nd of October 2017. And we have come such a long way that I think the second board will be uh, uh, announced very soon as well. So a lot of time has elapsed since uh, SAPRA has uh, transformed from MCC to SAPRA. Uh, the CEO was appointed by the board after consultation with the Minister of Health. And I'm sure you are aware that that is is Dr. Botumelo uh, Semete Mokokotlela. Uh, the board committees, um, so the board has subcommittees that oversee finance, risk, audit and governance, HR and remuneration, IT and technical oversight, um, well, technical oversight and regulatory strategy, as well as communication issues. And uh, SAPRA has become operational on February 1st, 2018. So section 21, uh, basically has come about because, uh, you know, the usual mandate of SAPRA is to oversee uh, and, and to register medicines in South Africa, but there was a need for a, a regulatory pathway where patients or, uh, you know, healthcare users could actually access unregistered medicines if they were not registered or outside the domain of a clinical trial. So this had to be actually based on uh, a, a legislative provision. And this has come about by uh, including section 21 in the medicines and related substances. Um, well, uh, act of, it's act one of 1965. And uh, so this basically allows for the to, uh, SAPRA to authorize the sale of unregistered medicines, medical devices, or in vitro diagnostics for certain purposes. And the subsections are listed there. Um, and I won't go through them, but I'll just take them as read. And I will then elaborate on them further uh, in the presentation. Um, so this, uh, the Act, uh, Section 21 of the Act uh, is actually supported by um, its, uh, its Regulation 29 of the General Medicines Regulation, which has come about in 2017, August of 2017. And uh, this regulation then says that, uh, you know, the um, authority may authorize the sale of an unregistered medicine and it is subject to the provision of information requirements and conditions as determined by the authority um, and on an application form obtainable from the office of the CEO so the next one says that um, the application form has to be duly completed. Um, you know, we can actually ask for various information such as a product brochure, uh, which contains a lot of information about the product. And given that a lot of the products are still investigational, we look at, you know, as much detail as possible given the product development um, and the, you know, uh, the snapshot uh, of the product development. So you have information such as the chemical um, uh, data, the pharmaceutical, which you know basically is on quality issues, 
preclinical pharmacological and uh, toxicological data, and where applicable human or animal pharmacological and clinical data with the medicine that's concerned. And uh, usually over here, we look at a minimum of phase 2B data um, in, from clinical trials. And then a witnessed informed consent form, uh, and we say here where applicable as well. It's stated in the regulations. Um, so then we also look at details of where the product is registered or where a registration is pending uh, with any other regulatory authority. And may I add, especially with the regulatory authorities with which SAPRA aligns itself. So these may be anything from the FDA, the TGA, EMA, and so on. So. Um, this will also support the application, uh, the motivation for the application. Um, there must be evidence of compliance of the manufacturer, uh, you know, with GMP standards. Um, and generally here, SAPRA complies with the uh, PICS uh, standards uh, for GMP, and that is what we go by. Then um, it must be clear and clear reasons must give, be given why a South African registered medicine cannot be used. Now, I know uh, that the attendees on this um, webinar are not necessarily only from the rare diseases uh, domain. And, uh, you, know, um, you know, so we, we actually look at, you know, um, why the um, registered medicine cannot be used. And, uh, these can range from anything, uh, you know, from safety uh, issues that the patient has experienced to, to the fact that there really is no registered medicine available. And, you know, what's been applied for is the last resort for that patient. Um, then any other information that may be required uh, by the authority, we will definitely ask for it. And uh, usually when we ask for further information, it's very forthcoming uh, with the section 21 applications. Then in terms of, um, your obligations once you receive uh, a, an authorization, um, you uh, shall su submit to the authority any adverse event report. Um, you must submit a progress report after every six months from the date following commencement of the use of the unregistered medicine. So it's not necessary that it is, um, you know, from the date of the authorization. Uh, perhaps you have commenced treatment uh, a few weeks later. And then um, a progress uh, a report uh, 30 days after the completion or termination of the use of the medicine is what is required. And um, this will, will be looked at, especially if uh, you are reapplying for um, a, a, you know, a further authorization for the patient to use the unregistered medicine. Um, so the authority may uh, impose additional conditions or they may request additional information. And you can understand that this is an unregistered medicine and especially if it's investigational, the information of, uh, avail uh, you know, the data available on the me uh, unregistered medicine, it's dynamic. Uh, you can get more information available a few months later and uh, this might be requested. Um, and the authority may also inspect the site where the unregistered medicine is manufactured, stored, or administered. And this has happened in the past. So it's not something that, um, you know, is, is neglected by the authority. We are also capacitating ourselves to, um, uh, you know, to conduct random inspections at these sites. Um, the authority may with, withdraw the authorization to treat the patient, um, we say, or animal, because if, 
Uh, this also applies to veterinary medicines, but that's handled by another department. Uh, so this is if the authority is of the opinion that the safety of any patient or animal is compromised or that the scientific reasons for administering the unregistered medicines, medicine has changed or for any other reason as determined by the authority. And this has happened before where the authority has withdrawn authorizations. So uh, in terms of labeling, and packaging an unregistered medicine. Uh, this must be uh, sufficiently identified and there is uh, provisions in the regulations uh, for the um, labeling and packaging of medicines. If um, section 21 is granted for post-trial access, um, then the trial medicine must be labeled in such a way that uh, it, it links back to the trial protocol and links back to the principal investigator of the site where uh, the patient has received the medicine from. So um, basically with post-trial access, uh, if the trial is not run anymore or if there isn't a rollover trial that has been authorized, then you can apply via section 21 to get post-trial access. And I guess this will uh, you know, apply in the rare diseases arena as well. So uh, there is a guideline for section 21 and it's obtainable from uh, the SAPRA website. So I've just put down uh, the link over here and uh, it's something that I encourage all of the uh, participants to play, uh, you know, to read. And, um, you know, if you have uh, areas for, of uh, clarity, please uh, send us an email uh, to, and I'll give you the email address at the end of the, towards the end of the presentation, but we will welcome, um, you know, um, questions from uh, stakeholders out there. Um, so basically, uh, you know, the guidelines um, have been uh, drafted and it has undergone uh, a period of public comment, as well as, you know, um, uh, internal comment as well in SAPRA. And there has been a lot of uh, input from the legal um, uh, legal uh, experts as well on this guideline. Um, so it, it's something that's, uh, you know, it has um, provided uh, enormous information out there to applicants. And um, so I would encourage you to uh, please go through the guideline and then if you have questions about section 21 and so on, please then, uh, you know, send us your, your queries, especially if the guidelines don't address them. Um, so in terms of affordability, um, so as I've said before, you know, the, the crux of uh, the evaluations of Section 21 applications, they are based on safety, efficacy, and quality. And that goes with any regulatory pathway in SAPRA. It's, uh, you know, that's the basic um, uh, you know, the, the core of the evaluations that take place, whether it's for registration or for a clinical trial application or whether it's a GMP inspection or so on, it's based on safety, efficacy and quality. Affordability is not a criteria for evaluation and it's not something that we, uh, you know, plan on including as a, a criteria, you know, criteria for evaluation. Um, so I just thought I would bring that up as well. Um, we have had many um, applications that were based mostly on affordability. And, uh, you know, and this was, uh, despite there being uh, various reg registered equivalents uh, that could treat the patient. And uh, we had to turn them down because there was no, uh, you know, benefit of it. the unregistered product over what was registered and available currently. So if, we, if I may go through the Section 21 application process, um, we've had, uh, you know, a few times where uh, we, we've had uh, system issues in terms of submitting applications and so on. So we, we, we then, uh, you know, 
at, at that time, it's the worst time to, to develop a new system when you're in a crisis mode because then it becomes, you know, very hard to implement and test and so on before it goes live. Uh, but we've, uh, we've, this is the second system that we've put in place now, and it is going to be more of a permanent solution that we have. It's an online submission system that we have, and it's accessible by going to the SAPRA homepage, and you click on e-services, there's a tab there for e-services. And the first option there is access to unregistered health products. Once you actually click that, you will get to the landing page of the Section 21 application uh, portal. And first of all, you will have to register as a user and we encourage healthcare workers and treating practitioners to do the registration because they will be submitting the application and the authorization goes out to them. Um, so you will be taken from page to page to give uh, information. Um, if it is a private sector application, you will have to also attach the proof of payment on that application. Um, and, and all of the details are given there, including the latest fee. Um, in that page where you attach, uh, you know, a proof of payment, we've also made provision for you to attach any other supporting document. And that's what I've gone through when I discuss the regulations. You can just, uh, you know, uh, uh, attach the investigator's brochure for the product. You can attach the GMP certificate. You can attach, you know, various other um, uh, supporting documents. If there's a study that uh, shows benefit uh, to patients uh, of the unregistered medicine, please go ahead and attach that as well. So uh, your response letters or requests for further information will, will reach you uh, from, there's an email address, it's app, app underscore notifications at sapra.org.za. Um, and then I also speak to people about, speak, uh, about checking their junk mailbox as well for a response, because sometimes they say they haven't received a response, but uh, you know that they please check the junk mailbox as well for an email from that email address. Um, and then, uh, you know, I mean, the uh, Section 21 email address has always been known. And, uh, you know, you can always feel free to send queries uh, for online applications or for other Section 21 related queries. You can send them to section21 at sapra.org.za. Um, and we, we actually, uh, we have someone manning that inbox as well, uh, uh, you know, on a regular basis so that we can actually then respond to your query. Um, so uh, uh, Kelly, I'm done with my presentation at the moment and um, perhaps uh, you, uh, you will take it further from here. Perfect. So um, Dr. Monba, thanks very, very much. I think it provided a very, very good overview of the process and um, I wanted to, if possible, just ask a couple of um, questions. I see we are, do we do have questions coming in as well. Um, firstly, I just wanted to reiterate to all the patients out there for it to be clear that the application needs to be made by your healthcare professional. It's not something that you can take on on your own. Um, I think some patients do, um, I suppose, because of the frustration of desperately wanting to access a treatment, um, kind of think that they can, uh, you know, intervene in the process. And unfortunately, it is something that needs to be handled uh, by your healthcare professional. So I just wanted to reiterate that. Um, Dr. Munbot, in terms of turnaround times, what is the anticipated or the estimated turnaround time uh, for a Section 21 application? That is a good question. So we have, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, a turnaround time of 24 working hours. It translates to three working days. It might be a little more if we, we are doing, a, you know, a more rigorous uh, evaluation of the application. But I think what has helped us is that we have uh, the submission portal as well. And so the application reaches us quicker. It's a, uh, you know, it becomes easier to navigate through. And when we are ready with the decision, it actually is easier for us to send out the response. So on average, I would say 
24 working hours, maybe a little longer. And if it's taking too long as well, if you want it to be faster than that as well, please pop us an email and we'll expedite it for you. Okay, I think that that's critically important for people to understand that there is in the event that there needs to be an escalation process that it is available. And I can say that the process is much easier now with the online system than back in the day when we were reliant on the facts. Um, because those faxes, wow, it used to be such a nightmare to try follow up. So um, that's really, really good news. Um, one of the other questions that I wanted to ask is, there is two types of Section 21s. The one is obviously on a name patient basis. And for those patients who might be listening, um, that is where you are the individual patient and it's, the product is being brought in specifically for you. Um, and the alternative one is that um, class, like that class emergency use. Can you explain just a little bit more about that particular um, application process and how, how those Section 21s work? Yes, certainly, Kelly. Um, and you know, if you if uh, the participants go to the Section Twenty One guideline, you will see at least four different scenarios listed there. And the one is the named patient application. And I think you know that would be more applicable to um, the rare diseases uh, arena, especially for chronic manage management of a chronic condition, um, where there is you know a bulk stock. We call it a bulk stock application and that is intended to be in place because of uh, you know the fact that you might need the med uh, uh, the medicine in uh, an emergency situation and that is perhaps in ICUs or in uh, theaters uh, you know so we we do allow for a, a small amount of bulk stock to be in place as well and that as well uh, you know it must be applied for by a, a healthcare professional because they are taking responsibility for prescribing the unregistered medicine and should there be some kind of, uh, you know, report, a negative report that we receive, we will need to go to a healthcare professional to actually, uh, you know, uh, send us a follow up reports on. Yeah. So um, if I can ask, um, and I'm, I might be a little controversial, but I just, I think it's a good way for us to understand the process. And, and one of the things, I think one of the narratives that were clearly, was clearly followed um, sort of, you know, definitively, definitely throughout last year was the issue around um, the use of a product like ivermectin in the COVID space. So this, I just, for just a disclaimer, not to encourage or discourage, that's not why I'm asking the question. But I think we, I think that there was a really big misunderstanding and it was actually one of the reasons um, that we wanted to put forward to have this webinar because I think we saw um, how a lack of understanding on the process really creates a negative um, narrative and uh, we also saw it with regards to the vaccine registration um, so I think it's it's quite ironic that well for me I think it is quite ironic that a lot of the um, individuals who we're kind of, um, you know, in this anti sarpa rhetoric because of um, not being able to access ivermectin as quickly as they would have wanted to, um, have also been the same individuals generally who are questioning a lot of stuff around the COVID vaccination. In that sort of, I just want to use that as an example, because I think it's something that all members of the public can relate to, right? So the issue wasn't at that stage um, that it simply hadn't, you know, government was denying anybody the right to use it. It was that the application process needed to be done. Am I correct in saying that? Yes, you're definitely correct in saying that. And I think, uh, you know, uh, I must say that you brought out a very ex interesting example. And um, I think from the start of the pandemic, there has been some information available about the benefit of ivermectin in management of the COVID-19 infection, some might even say it helps with prophylaxis. So we had received Section 21 applications and those were turned down because the, the first of all, the evidence wasn't very strong to support the, the use of the, these unregistered medicines in, um, in the management of COVID-19 infections. Uh, but there came a point where we actually, uh, SAPRA received many reports of people using 
um, substandard and counterfeit ivermectin products, uh, especially products that might contain other actives in them. And then uh, Sapra, if I may use the word, Sapra had to crack down on that. And, uh, you know, I think then it came out that Sapra is banning ivermectin, but Sapra was in fact cautioning against the use of substandard and counterfeit products. Uh, also the use of veterinary uh, formulations of ivermectin, those have got other actives in there and uh, those were not formulated for human use. So Safra had to put out some kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, communication out there as well. Now, the other issue is that with the Section 21 applications, we have to have a way of ensuring that only approved products are actually finding their way to the patients out there. So Sapra welcomed the opportunity and we developed a, an access program for ivermectin. Uh, it was also on the condition that reporting requirements are complied with. Um, then companies then applied for their products to be, uh, you know, accessed through the program. We evaluated those products and we found that, uh, you know, a, a lot of these products were, uh, you know, uh, suitable for human use. And then the access program commenced around the end of January. So it's, it's you know, uh, SAPRA is very, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, cautious with the, uh, the fact that for many products, and if we don't approach it in the right way and get uh, some kind of regulatory or oversight, you might be taking a product that is actually going to bring harm to you. And, um, and you know, we actually then developed in the same link that I've provided for the SAPRA guideline, you would find that there's an ivermectin access program guideline there as well. And, um, you know, it has helped many patients to access ivermectin. The reporting is not so good on that. And I would like to encourage, uh, you know, any of the participants here as well to spread the me message that um, we need those reports. And the reports are basically uh, on treatment outcomes. Uh, whether the patient has recovered or didn't recover or what other efficacy outcome was uh, experienced. Was there also a safety outcome that was experienced? We need to know. Then the other issue is we need to know other things as the patient have concomitant conditions such as diabetes or hypertension and so on. And were they taking any other concomitant drugs as well, you know, medicines to, to uh, treat the COVID-19 infection? Uh, it, it, you know, it's that quite a, a comprehensive report back that we required from the healthcare professional. Thank you, Kelly. Sure. Thanks. No, and that's and that's really. I think it's really, really important for members of the public to understand that and and to understand that Sapra's um, uh, main priority is to ensure that what the drugs that are being given to patients are of a good quality and are you know for the intended purposes that they've been brought in to do. And personally, as as a patient um, and and as someone who has a lot of experience in dealing with chronically ill patients. I mean, that's what I would anticipate and expect from the regulators to ensure that the products are safe and effective. So um, it makes a lot of sense to us. But I think, I think a lot of times, particularly like now during a pandemic, where people there is a fair amount of uh, desperation, for lack of a better word, I guess. And um, and I think people then obviously, um, you know, fear drives drives a lot of uh, a lot of emotion. And I think that that's was one of the issues around last year with, with regards to ivermectin. Someone has asked a question and it is actually something that um, I'm, I've, I've experienced it, but I'm actually not sure on the answer. In the event that you've got patients accessing a section 21 product and a alternative product, um, a similar molecule or the same you know, uh, molecule from another manufacturer is then registered does the Section 21 um, approval then get withdrawn on the basis that there is now a registered product? So basically, if um, 
the product, uh, you know, a, another a product gets registered and you have an authorization for an unregistered medicine, that authorization is valid for six months from the date that it was authorized. So even if you have, whether it got authorized one day before the alternative got registered, you still have, let's say, six months more to, to access that unregistered medicine. But what we encourage, um, you know, uh, healthcare professionals to do uh, is to work with uh, pharmaceutical companies and generally, you know, uh, with all of the transparency and so on, so on from SAPRA's side, companies now generally have an idea of when they're going to get registration of their product. And, um, you know, so they, they then, uh, you know, uh, if they are the, the applicant for the uh, product that's about to be uh, registered, then they let us know, uh, you know, sooner, uh, well, uh, give us, send us a list of all the patients who are on the product and, um, you know, for how much longer they might need it. They, need, they tell us about, you know, other challenges with, with actually putting the, the product on the market. And this can vary. There's a whole lot of, it could be a pricing issue, it could be a, a, some other marketing issue and so on. But are we then aware of it, but, uh, and, and we then allow a further three months where we might accept, uh, you know, a few more applications. And then the company has to then keep us informed as to when will the product be accessible on, in the market out there. And, um, you know, then we, we actually then, thereafter, no Section 21 authorizations are issued. The second regulatory pathway that you can, a company can then access the product is, um, well, obviously, this it, it has to be the, the, the company that has the, the um, registered product in the interim they can apply for what we call a section 36 exemption to so section 36 exemption allows for any uh, variation in uh, okay variation is not a good word but any um, uh, exception to uh, a, a condition of registration or a requirement for registration. And it's a very detailed uh, request. And they've got to say, why are they bringing uh, a product that not necessarily was evaluated for registration? Um, and in that, they can also then state that certain product uh, patients have accessed the product through Section 21. And uh, usually those applications get approved as well. And that's the, that, that's the preferred way to go because then, you know, it, it actually then um, uh, th there's more continuity from the Section 36 to, uh, to, to, to then marketing the registered product. Thank you. Okay. Shame. Sorry, I, I feel like I'm bombarding you with questions, but so many questions are coming. I through. welcome them. Okay. It's fine. <laughs> um, so the one, um, the one question is obviously at the moment, as it stands, your your approval is only valid for six months. In the event of a chronically a, a chronic patient who's who's intended to be on this product indefinitely, will Sapra at some point look at extending? Um, that regulatory time frame, or is it bound? Um, I know that scripting, obviously, your scripts are only valid for six months, and I don't know if it's linked to that script. Um, but is it something? I think it becomes obviously. Uh, firstly, it's a it's a cost. Um, you know, it's the reapplication cost. It's twice a year for chronic patients that that can become prohibitive. But also, I suppose it's the um, it's the stress of continuously having to reapply. So, is there any consideration from software side with regards to extending that approval process in the event that you've shown efficacy and stability from a patient perspective, and they they needing it in on an ongoing basis? I think more so, particularly in the rare disease space, where uh, the pro the likelihood of registration might you know it might be slim, uh, simply because you might only have one or two patients in the entire country using the product. Um, you know, that's a very interesting question. And um, uh, uh, first of all, you know, uh, the healthcare professional, uh, you know, I mean, especially in the rare disease ar arena, they need to have constant uh, oversight of what their patient is taking and whether it's needed, uh, you know, it's needed, uh, uh, um, uh, it's needed on a, on a long-term basis and so on. So, you know, the six months that we, we actually, uh, uh, 
you know, uh, give to the validity of, a, of an authorization. It's very, uh, you know, uh, it's backed by the fact that the patient needs to see their healthcare professional at least every six months. And then, uh, you know, and, and, you know, their clinical picture is then evaluated and so on. And then the reapplication takes place. Um, SAFRA has not actually extended the six months, um, you know, for, for, for applications in the past. And it's, it's basically based on the fact that this is an unregistered medicine. Sometimes it might even be an investigational medicine. And as we know, you know, there are products out there that, um, you know, especially in the oncology uh, uh, field, uh, you find that long-term effects are only found out uh, a few, uh, you know, after a medium term period or you know i'd say two or three years later you have long term effects and so on so you know i think with sapra we are quite um firm on the fact that every six months there must be an application and we then uh you know we will then follow up on progress reports as well and um you know just to have an idea of what uh what the uh, benefits are to the patient. Um, if the risks and the benefits, um, you know, are actually uh, balanced in, in a patient given the condition, then it will continue. The authorization will be, uh, be issued. The reauthorization will be issued. But if there is some kind of indication that it actually is, uh, you know, not actually efficacious in this patient or there is a safety issue, then a reauthorization will not be issued. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, someone has asked if a product is available via Section 21, does that product need to be filed for registration as well? Um, is it like a is it like a mandated thing that you you know that you would have to eventually apply for registration? That's also a very interesting question. Uh, so the short answer is, uh, yes, SAPRA will encourage uh, the applicant or well, the pharmaceutical company to submit a registration dossier. But having said that, uh, it's complicated. You know, I mean, it, it depends on the uh, pharmaceutical company. And uh, as far as we are aware, um, the submission of a registration dossier uh, to SAPRA, it's... It, it's, it's not something that the regulator can influence, but SAPRA would like to encourage that the, you know, the, the product is submitted for registration. Okay. Um, and in the event, um, uh, Section 21, if you've received approval, um, someone's asking, who can the HCP order the product from? Does it need to be the manufacturer if present in the country or a wholesaler who can do the parallel import? Um, so Kelly, I think the parallel, parallel import is another issue and we won't be using that term in terms of section 21, but the health professional working with the pharmacist who's going to dispense it, it's totally up to them who they can import it from, you know, it's, uh, um, it's totally up to them and maybe they're aware of companies that do uh, a whole lot of products or Within the rare disease arena, it's a particular company that has a particular product uh, that can bring that product in. So, uh, you know, they will have to work closely together and, uh, and get that information. Um, and the reason why I said parallel imports, uh, we're going to leave that out of this conversation is that's a different process. That's uh, more of a minister's a approval. And that is if there is a registered equivalent available uh, for section 21 should there be a registered equivalent available we won't even consider an application and it's that simple yeah so and i just i think i would just like to add for any patients out there because i get this question all the time um you know we've we've been given approval but now like where do we actually get it and patients are more than welcome to contact us there's there's um we've got you know, companies who we work with that actually that is what they do. Um, they bring in Section 21 products and we'd be happy to to connect your healthcare professional, et cetera, with them to be able to arrange for the product to be brought in. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there because we often get that question as well. 
Um, the another question that came through is, um, um, okay, so this is, uh, I'm going to, uh, Mark, I see your question that's come through. I'm going to just leave it for one second and we'll get into that now, if you don't mind. Um, is there, oh, these are, they're getting, they're getting complex. Okay, so um, I'm going to then go to Mark's. So several international guidelines for the treatment of many rare diseases advise the use of a medicinal product, which is off-label, which is why, um, and, and I know, uh, Dr. Mann, but this isn't your, this isn't your wheelhouse. Um, do you have to report this every time? Can you ask for a general exception in certain specific rare indications? And I just, I think before you answer, I just also want to clarify or, or just mention that I think a lot of the, a lot of um, the rare disease treatment modalities are very often off-label products because there's no clear uh, registered treatment anywhere in the world for their condition. And doctors are very often desperate to try to provide them with some uh, some relief, you know, symptomatic relief. So very often um, off-label is requested. So just to clarify the question, do you have to report the off-label usage every time? Um, is, that an, is that a requirement? Does SARPA need to be made aware of um, products that are being used off-label or have been prescribed off-label? Or are you comfortable in the, in the clinician's um, ability to prescribe based on his experience? Okay, so now is the time for me to just delve a bit deeper on off-label use. So off-label use implies that the product is registered for another indication with SAPRA. And uh, obviously off-label means that it's, uh, it's an indication that's not approved. The, the, the medicine is registered with SAPRA for another indication. So generally, uh, you know, uh, there were a lot of queries on this. And um, uh, it was a while back that the MCC actually had got a legal opinion on it. And, uh, you know, the, the, the actual conclusion was that this doesn't fall in the domain of the regulator. The off-label use is purely at the discretion of the healthcare provider who takes responsibility for prescribing a registered product off-label. Should there be a safety, um, you know, a safety issue and so on, it must get reported. That must get reported to SAPRA, and it must be stated that. Um, you know, it has been used off-label. So the unit to contact here would be the pharmacovigilance uh, unit, and it must be submitted as um, an adverse uh, reaction report. And, um, you know, then they will actually, they have, a, they, they also have an online submission system as well. Uh, but generally with the off-label use, uh, the only part that would be monitored is the safety part, uh, the safety aspect of the registered medicine that has been used off-label. Okay. Um, I just also want to um, add just, I think that there's a very, very big misconception sometimes from a patient perspective um, when they've been issued Section 21 approval, that is basically a doctor's license to dispense the product or for you to bring it into the country. It is not equated to a reimbursement approval. That is a separate process. I think very often um, patients will say, you know, I, I'm still I'm having to pay so much for my medication and um, we have got Section 21 approval. Section 21 approval does not equate to um, funding reimbursement. That's a separated process. And also just to say that from a funding perspective, they won't or they won't consider even looking at an application from a reimbursement perspective without Section 21 approval. So the process when needing to use one of these products is always to first get Section 21 approval, and once you've got that approval, to then approach your funder uh, specifically around the application, and that is two separate processes. I think sometimes patients confuse the two and they get really excited because they got a section 21 approval in 24 hours and they're like, great, I'm gonna be bringing my drugs in and then I have to be the person that says to them, hold on, we haven't got anyone to pay for them yet. So um, I just wanted to throw that out so that people um, made the distinction. Someone's asked, um, not really a section 21 question, but an interesting question and you might know the answer to it. Well, um, what would be the regulated path to follow to donate unused prescription medications to a person who needs them? Are you able to give your medication, medication that's unused, 
a patient's passed away and you know might have excess stock or anything like that are you able to give it to another patient you know there isn't actually a regulatory pathway for something like that but i would say that uh, you know, uh, the, the recipient, uh, there's a donor and a recipient there as well. And the recip uh, recipient must uh, accept these very cautiously and obviously with advice from their own healthcare professional because, um, you know, it's... Uh, it's something that you've got to ensure that, okay, if it's a product that they are uh, taking as chronic medicine, perhaps, that it actually is the identical product and, uh, you know, uh, it will actually treat the condition that they are actually suffering from. Um, sometimes if you continue, uh, you know, medicating yourself on a different product, you might have a change of your outcome. And, uh, you know, and that is why I say do so under medical supervision and uh, you know you then covered yeah and also just to state that there's such important safety mechanisms in the logistics and distribution of pharmaceutical products and you never know what's happened to them after they've actually been dispensed to their families so all that uh, personally i would discourage it kelly you know i mean i wouldn't really encourage that practice but obviously there's there, there might be an underlying benevolent reason for doing such a thing so please, if you have to, and only if you have to, then do so under medical supervision. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to squeeze through all these questions that have come through. Um, I think we've answered that one. What happens to the product? Uh, what happens when a product is on the market by one manufacturer and SAPRO still approves the Section 21 application for another manufacturer. So I'm guessing that they're saying that there's a registered product and then there's still a Section 21. Does the manufacturer still need to provide the product to the patient under Section 21? Um, the commissioner, I think that that question's come from you. I'm not sure if you can maybe just expand on it a little so that we can be clear. Are you saying that um, when you say what happens when the product is on the market by one manufacturer, are you are you meaning that there is already a registered alternative? Um, and when you say, does the manufacturer still need to provide the product to the patient under Section 21, are you talking about the manufacturer of the unregistered product? If you can maybe just provide some clarity back in the chat box so that we can answer that. Um, uh, someone has asked a question, which I know also came up at the beginning of COVID, which is with regards to the hydroxychloroquine. Um, is this back on section 21? I'd like to know if hydro hydro uh, hydroxychloroquine is back on section 21. Uh, yes, Kelly, it's definitely, you see, uh, with hydroxychloroquine, it um, was made available via Section 21 for rheumatoid arthritis, um, uh, SLE patients, and um, other uh, rheumatology con uh, conditions. The moment the pandemic hit, there was, uh, you know, uh, a threat to the supply of chloroquine, uh, which is registered, and hydroxychloroquine um, for, for the patients who are on chronic uh, uh, medication. So, uh, you know, at, at that time, there was a bit of a, you know, uh, of a concern about the supply of these products, and is it going to be uh, secured for the patients who actually require it on a, a chronic basis? So um, that has subsided uh, a while back, you know, after there has been publications uh, and, and so on and recommendations, especially from the WHO on the, um, you know, lack of benefits of hydroxychloroquine in COVID-19 um, infections. And um, I must say we are receiving, a, you know, a fair amount of applications uh, uh, for Section 21 authorization of hydroxychloroquine hydroxychloroquine and um, I don't see that there is uh, you know any supply problem as such I haven't been informed of such so uh, if you want a section 21 authorization for hydroxychloroquine please submit your application perfect and then I think in the interest of time I'm going to just answer one more question um Someone has said uh, SARP is responsible, uh, you've mentioned SARPA's responsible view in allowing access to treatments of ivermectin to patients, etc. 
Are SAPRA at all concerned with the supply of compounded ivermectin or compounded products in general where no quality control is implemented? So when um, there was a product that was an ivermectin product that was registered um, in the first quarter of this year, and that was more of a dermatological uh, preparation, and that con contained uh, ivermectin. So it was used for um, uh, rosacea and a few other dermatological conditions. The moment that became registered, compounding was then uh, seen as uh, allowable, uh, you know, because the, the active has been registered. So, um, you know, that is actually outside of uh, SAPRA's domain, but SAPRA is looking at a mechanism of look of, of uh, you know, um, of, of uh, having some kind of oversight over compounded products. Uh, and that's purely because it is seen as a small, uh, you know, a, a a small, uh, uh, smaller kind of form of manufacturing. So uh, SAPRA is looking at that at the moment. Okay, I see Kameshni has come back with her um, just elaboration on her on her question, and she is saying uh, my interpretation was correct. So that if there's a registered product. Um, must the unregistered medication that was being provided under Section Twenty One must it continue, or would it be would it stop? Um, uh, Kelly, I would just say with that question, uh, may I invite Kameshni to please send the query uh, through to section 21 at sapra.org.za or send it to my email address. My email address is actually um, uh, available on the Sapra website. And then we can engage on this uh, because I think there is uh, there, there's some specific information that I will require from Kameshni and I will then uh, advise her appropriately on this question. Perfect. And then I just want to say, um, Sandra, I've seen your question um, with regards to you know, pulmonary hypertension and the fact that there's so few um, registered in South Africa, but I, I don't necessarily think that that's something that uh, Dr. Munbot can answer, but it is definitely um, something that we would like to, you know, in our, in our follow-up webinars that we have like this, like to address in terms of understanding why there is such a low registration rate of these rare disease products. Um, unfortunately, I think the long and short of, of that is it comes largely down to the funding environment and the reimbursement environment. But so that is a, a very, very complex discussion that would need its own webinar. Um, Dr. Munbot, I just wanted to say thank you so much for the information and the informative talk. Um, I really think, you know, just given listening to some of the questions and stuff that are coming through, you can see that it is absolutely necessary. Um, I think as much as, uh, you know, like you've got your guidelines and stuff like that on the website, I think sometimes from a patient perspective, it's a little bit intimidating because this isn't necessarily the patient's, you know, it's, it's not their field of reference and uh, we don't always necessarily understand the terminology and the process, et cetera. And obviously, again, you've got the emotional impact that comes into comes into play because this is our lives. Um, so really, I do very much appreciate the fact that SACRA has been willing to engage and, and, and assist us in, in clearing up a lot of these processes. And also just that the lines of communication are, are open for further engagement and that, uh, you know, you can send an email to section 21 at sarpa.org.za. Um, you know, just the fact that there is that opportunity um, in the event that patients are struggling or there's a there's an issue or something needs to be escalated, I think is really, really encouraging for um, for all of us that are in this and are reliant on being able to access these products to, to keep us going. I see that there have been a lot of comments in the chat box to say that it's been a very, very informative and valuable session. So um, we're really, really grateful. Um, I do also see there has been some, uh, a lady that has been saying that she's had some issues with regards to Section 21. Um, Makati, my advice to you would be to definitely email through to Section 21 at sarpa.org.za um, simply so that uh, you can expand on exactly what uh, some of the issues that you experienced and again it's not about um, necessarily I understand the frustration because I've dealt with it personally um, in my own in my own uh, personal situation those who don't know my son had to start off as a section 21 product um, but I do think uh, I, and I think that we think 
it's always uh, the regulator that's at fault. But sometimes, in actual fact, there's various other elements that come into play. Um, and I know previously with the faxes that that used to be one of the biggest problems. Um, so maybe you can um, engage with SAPRA at that email and um, expand a little bit on the frustrations that you've had. And let's hope we can find a solution. So Dr. Munbad, thank you so very, very much. We really, really appreciate your time today. Um, and we absolutely look forward to engaging um, going forward. And hopefully we'll find more opportunities to do things like this with SAPRA um, to really, really just help patients and the healthcare community as users have a better understanding, um, you know, uh, from a from a process perspective, uh, so that we can all become a little bit more uh, participatory in our healthcare process and our healthcare journey, but also that we can be more informed and that we can all work together towards our common goals. So we really, really thank you for your time today. And a big thank you to you too, Kelly. Um, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to present on Section 21. And then, uh, you know, I mean, um, I, I just wanted to quickly say that, uh, you know, we have a process for uh, appealing a, a, a rejection. And uh, if there's any new information that has been submitted for an application, uh, you know, uh, you actually then write to my senior manager, you state what the new information is or what information hasn't been considered in your opinion and then you uh, you know and you also state how would you like this to be resolved and um, you know and then we take it from there. Yeah absolutely and I think that that's also something patients need to realize it, particularly the our rare disease patients or patients trying to access innovative molecules unfortunately guys the data is not always on our side in the sense that we don't have a lot of it but there's always new studies becoming available. So try and try again. Um, it, there might not have been enough information to make a decision five years ago, but a lot has changed and things, you know, obviously more information becomes available. So don't give up on trying. Um, if necessary, you know, keep following up with your healthcare professional to make sure that the treatment is still a relevant option. And if it is, and there's more information available, obviously make the time to do the reapplication because, we know that in the rare disease space, it is data is is not easy to come by. Um, so, Dr. Manbad, thanks once again. Thanks to all of those who attended. Um, thanks to everyone who's been commenting and stuff on Facebook as well. And this will be made available for anybody. It will be on the rare disease website for future use for anybody who might want to refer back to it, or if a colleague or something has missed it and you'd like to share it with them, you'll be able to do so. So, we will also be sending out so just a quick um, post survey link. Uh, similarly to, it will be the same questions that we asked you earlier today, but it's just for us to understand the knowledge transfer and how successful we've been in actually clearing up some of the misrepresentation. So once again, thanks everyone. And we look forward to seeing you guys at the next one. Cheerio. Thank you.